Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Across Campus on the Logger Nation Station, KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. My name is Casey Krolchek. Across Campus is dedicated to providing a place where Puget Sound students, faculty, and friends of the university can discuss ideas that inspire them. In the past, we've featured local clubs, organizations, and classes like the Black Student Union, Students for a Sustainable Campus, and the freshman seminar, The Beautiful Game, and many more. They pick the topics, and I'm here to facilitate discussion and work the soundboard. So with that, I'd like to introduce this week's guests, Jenny Katz and Kira Garretts, who will be talking about their class, COM322, Television Culture. Jenny, Kira, welcome to the show. Our wonderful host. Um, and that really got me hooked um, with media studies and sort of becoming media literate, if you will. Um, and so when I was looking for classes, I saw television culture, and I thought it would be an excellent follow-up to Common Diversity and um, heard really great things about uh, Professor Owen, who instructs the course. So that is ultimately what led me to the class. All right, very cool. How about you, Kira? Um, I'm a senior as well, a politics and government major. Um, I came to the class because uh, one of my friends had taken film culture with Professor Owen the semester before and really recommended her. And as a child, I watched way too much TV, so I'm like, something I love plus an amazing teacher, how could this go wrong? All right, very cool. So I guess moving on, I would like to give uh, our listeners an idea of like how the, cl how the class laid out. So like, how did that work? When you, got, when you guys got to class, what did you do for preparation and how did class discussions go? Um, well, each class period, uh, for the most part, we had to turn in a journal entry, which was basically a reading response to whatever articles uh, Professor Owen assigned. And oftentimes, um, we would watch television episodes that were like put onto Moodle or ones that we would search for, um, and have to apply certain concepts um, to what we actually saw. So it was a really like cool way of doing doing homework. Yeah, and I mean, it sounds like a lot of writing to do a page or two for each class period, and it's a twice-a-week class, but it actually really helps you sort of engage the material and understand it, and it makes writing the next paper so much easier because you're already used to writing about the authors and um, stuff like that. And when we'd actually get to class, we'd usually watch clips of a few different television shows or an entire episode of something like M.A.S.H. before um, starting our discussion or as a wrap-up of the discussion. So it's an 80-minute class, and we usually spend about 15 or 20 minutes watching something that was pertinent to discussion. Okay, cool. Actually, Jenny, did you bring in the syllabus for the class? I did, yes. It is right here. All right, why, why don't you just give us, like, like, go ahead and read it. Give us a Cool. This is the course that. description uh, for COM322. Um, it reads, This course addresses the cultural influences of American television from 1946 to the present day. In particular, the course examines the intersections of the television medium with politics, government, social movements, cultural conflicts, film aesthetics, advertising, and consumerism. Some of the topics covered in this course include the changing character of broadcast news from, for example, Edward R. Murrow to Jon Stewart, women and feminism in television, television genres, and television and race. Um, and so in the course, we it was broken up into three sections. Um, do you want to talk about that, Kira? Yeah, sure. Because television is such a broad range of <laughs> stuff on TV all the time, uh, Professor Owen decided to focus in on comedy in different eras. So first okay. we looked at sitcoms in early television from you know starting in the late 40s and going through the early 70s and looking at shows like I Love Lucy, The Mary Tyler Moore Show, that kind of thing. And then in the second section of the class, we looked at, in the 80s, um, variety show comedy, and we focused a lot on the show In Living Color, which was written and produced by... Um, Keenan Ivory Wayne's, yeah, the Wayne's Brothers. The Wayne's Brothers, which were, uh, they're black, which was a really big deal in the 80s for them to have so much creative control. And then in the last section of the class, we looked at broadcast journalism and also comedy by focusing that in on Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert and sort of seeing how they were being innovative in journalism. And what would you guys describe as, like, the key points of the class? Like, as, as you worked through it, like, what kind of specific points did you want to address or what were the big ideas that started to come out? That 
television is a really important medium, <laughs> as even for scholarly discussion. It's not just a way of having fun, um, as well as there's there has to be like a balance in it because it's it's such a um, <laughs> It's a, it's a form of entertainment, and it's also a way for people to make money, and so you get a lot of really interesting things as a result of that that no one really anticipated. Which, for sure. I, yeah, which I think we'll talk about a little bit more in the second section. Well, yeah, I'm sure like, if you're in the industry, you want to focus on the artistic side of it, and if you're not in the industry, you're going to want to focus, I mean, you're going to put more of a spin on right. like how it is, just like a way of making money. It's a business, but you know, it's an interesting yeah. dynamic. Something that we really focused on in this course, and Kira and I are actually both in film culture this semester with Professor Owen, um, is the audience reception. That is a key kind of aspect of, of communication studies in general, um, not only kind of setting the formal elements of these shows, um, of the genres, such as sitcom, but really looking at how um, television has impacted multiple generations um and it's yeah it's been very interesting all right great any other points that you want to bring up as far as like i guess an introduction to the course uh um, before we take a break i think it it's cool it's a cool it's a cool course because it um it kind of makes you branch out of your kind of normal like study habits like it was such a cool thing being, being assigned television shows to watch and being assigned to think critically about television shows that I had, like, watched as, like, a kid on TV land. I was, like, one of those weirdos who watched TV land, like, chronically as a child. Like, like the Dick Van Dyke show, Mary Tyler Moore show, Happy Days, those are some of my favorites. So it was really cool to be able to revisit some of those shows and look at it um, through the lens of, like, a media kind of scholar and critic and... Um, yeah, that's that's been really cool. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, this is the first time I'd ever taken a communications class, and it was just amazing, because, yeah, TV is something you don't really think about, you just sort of consume, consume yeah. but yeah. then, like, if you do stop to think about it and look at it, there's some really interesting stuff going on that I would have just never, it would have never occurred to me just watching with, like, before I read some of these readings and talked about it in yeah, class. How did it feel for you jumping into a 300-level course when you hadn't previously taken a comm course? Did that work out well for you? Oh, yeah, it was fine. I mean, it's um, it's a lot of reading and it's a lot of writing, but um, at this point, I'm sort of used to that. I take a lot of reading in intensive classes as a politics major. No, was it, was it, what does that say about comm majors? Does it mean that anybody could do that? <laughs> no, no, I'm, no. I'm just kidding. It's a lot of work. Although it's kind, of, the class kind of made me jealous of comm majors. I want to take more classes. So <laughs> I know it's fun. I've, I've only so taken fun. I've only taken one comm course, and that was really fun. So I guess la last point before we wrap up this segment: uh, What kind of characters does the class attract? Is it, is it was it mostly comm majors who were in the class? Was it people from outside the major? Like what did, what did the class look like? It's fairly mixed. Um, yeah, there were. I'd say it was about half com major, half non major. Yeah, the class is kept pretty small. I think it's about twenty people, and she limits the size on purpose because fosters better discussion. Yeah, and I think it, it was a great size, and there were definitely like people like me who'd never taken a communications class before, and then there were com majors or people that have just taken a couple, and I think it worked well because everyone was willing to do the reading and participate a lot. I mean, you've got to want to participate, but it seems like. This is a subject that most people can really engage in and have a lot of fun with, and so it makes participation pretty easy, because everyone has so much to say. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Um, you're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. It's far enough away, though, that it's like not just like my face. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. Like When I was over here, I was like feeling my elbow. I kept on like, looking yeah, over Yeah, this, right really, this is a great view. Yeah, that's better. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to KPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. My name is Casey Krolchek. I'm the host of the show across campus, and today in the studio, we have Jenny Katz and Kira Garretts talking about their class, uh, Television Culture. So you guys, welcome, again, once again, welcome to, the, welcome to the show. And in this next segment, we're going to be talking about Course Vocab, because as I met with Kira... 
and Jenny, I kind of realized that there was some vocab from the course that would be absolutely vital, vital to understanding the conversation that we're having today. So with that, I'll, I'll, let's just jump, jump straight into it. What are some of the key terms uh, for the course, and like how, how would you describe those so we can better get through our conversation? Well, one of the uh, key terms that we get pretty early on in the course is a cultural forum. Uh, it comes out of a reading from communication scholars Newcomb and Hirsch, and it's basically the idea that television is a place where different societal forces come together and sort of work, work out tensions that may be existing under the surface in society that no one really wants to talk about, but they're so important that they have to be expressed somewhere. Um, and that their, their argument in this article is that by ex being expressed on television, the conversation is the important part, and it sort of allows society to work through their issues without directly addressing them. Right. And so we looked at this in the context of um, early sitcoms, like I Love Lucy, how um, Lucy was always trying to get out of her you know, gender typical role of the housewife. She was always trying to get out and get a job or something like that. And it was always hilarious because she would go way over the top and also because the viewer knew at the end of the episode she'd be exact back exactly where she started and <sighs> nothing crazy would have happened. I mean, she would have done something crazy. But at but the you're, end, but you're, but you're back, to, you're back be, to the starting point. Right, almost, normalcy would so. be restored. Exactly. And so there was a way to present alternatives like, oh, well, what if women were in the workforce and stuff like that? And then without, like, making everyone freak out because at the end of the episode it wouldn't work. But the idea that by presenting these alternatives to societal norms, they could be talked about and discussed because if you can't talk about something, then it doesn't, there's no way for progress to happen. You know, so, side note on that, like, you kind of bring up an interesting point in how, like, a, a television show introduced these kind of, like, crazy new ideas, but then just kind of said, like, oh, well, don't worry about it too much. Like, it all goes back to, uh, back to normal. Like, did you guys get any, any idea of how the producers of a show like that approach that? Were they re were they really trying to create like a social forum where they could talk about like women in the workplace, but kind of just kind of more weave themselves weave themselves into the social fabric, or like I mean, was, like, was it, what, it done on purpose? Well, yeah, what's it, was it done on purpose? And what like what do producers? What are producers thinking? Is that something that the course really talks about? Yeah, we did a reading um, pretty early on, on as well uh, by um, Marxist scholar Eileen Meehan, who examines the tension between artistry and industry, um, which is another sort of term that is pretty prevalent throughout the course. Um, and what she basically says is, because the television market, especially um, starting in the 1980s with the advent of cable, um, where you have tons and tons of compete, competing channels, um, there is a need for innovation and artistry, and there's a need for writers to sort of bring in um, these creative topics. And at the same time, she writes that there is always this trend of sort of, sort of uh, streamlining, and you see shows sort of like picking up on new things to be that new and upcoming show, but then you see a following like onslaught of other shows that sort of model themselves after this new sort of innovative um, advance that's been made. Uh, so that's that's been sort of a key component of, of our study as well, just this tension between uh, artistry versus industry. The, the idea basically is that television wants to make money, and so they go to the thing that is sort of on the edge of like, oh, this is new and different, and maybe it could be socially explosive, but because it's got that volatile possibility, everyone's interested in it, so we're going to get more viewers, we're going to get more ad money. And so you get this really interesting mix, like Jenny was saying, because you have people that are trying to create change, and so television wants to make money off of that, and so you, it just, it's an expression of what's going on in society at the same time as it's trying to capitalize on it. Yeah, and mm -hmm. a really incredible example of this sort of concept of artistry versus industry television as a, an important cultural forum, um, I think is the show uh, Norman Lear's All in the Family from the 70s. And we sort of looked at how um, the cultural forum and this uh, and another term, liminality, um, which is essentially a stage of license um, 
when rules can be broken or bent and when rules may be reversed and when ca categories can be overturned. Um, so that's sort of like the artistry aspect of it. Um, like a willing suspension of disbelief yeah. by the audience means that whoever's on stage can sort of break whatever rules they want and right. not get in trouble for it. Like you have Archie Bunker um, being this really extreme sort of stereotypical working class blue collar conservative man um, and in this sort of liminal space that the show offers, um, he's able to kind of show this really extreme, um, these really extreme beliefs that during the 70s could offend a lot of people. He was incredibly racist and sexist, and um, at the same time, you have, he could, you could also have a, a group of people identifying with him. He spoke to a huge population of, of the country. So yeah, that, that was a great show. Well, and another concept that you guys brought up last night when we met was ambivalence. And mm -hmm. what what is the concept of ambivalence uh, as it's used in the course? Um, ambivalence is the idea that something um, can be read in more than one way. So you're sitting and you're watching All in the Family and Archie's expressing like really racist or sexist tendencies, being like, oh, women shouldn't work. Like he says that. And you can either take that as exactly face value, like, oh, yeah, I totally agree with that. Like, women shouldn't be out of the home. That's not their ro role in society. Or you can take that as the producer bringing it to the extreme and sort of mocking it almost. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's harder to see in that situation, maybe. But you've got people that sort of read it as a confirmation of their own beliefs or people that are like, well, is he really saying that? Because then all the other characters disagree with Archie. And yeah. so they say, oh, no, here's all these alternatives. So it's like, which w what's really the point of the producer when he's saying that? So you, since you're not exactly sure, that's a really big, it's a really important component of TV is that there's a lot of, of different ways that the same thing can be read depending on w where the audience is coming from. Like, that's a really big part of TV, I think. Jenny mentioned earlier is that, like, audience engagement really affects how uh, how television is interpreted because like different backgrounds of different people can really affect it like if you're conservative and you agree with him or if you're really liberal and you think oh no he's totally crazy the meaning of the show can completely change and then what was the last term that we uh, we had, we had talked yes. about balance between artistry and mm -hmm. industry and we've kind of, we've kind of touched on that al already but if you guys just want to expand on, on that concept. Um, let's see. Um, I guess we could talk about another example of how that was brought up in the course, where else we saw artistry versus industry. Um, I'm trying to think. Well, Gitlin, one of the authors that we read, um, talks about hegemony in television, and it sort of builds off this idea that television is an industry and they're out to make money, and so... Hegemony is um, like the, the prevailing dominant, norms, the, right. the dominant norms of a society. And Gitlin argues that over time, because TV is always trying to capitalize on the new ideas, the new social tensions, it wants to stay like with whatever group is the most popular because that's where they're going to get the most money. And so they're always in they start always incorporating these new ideas. And so the dominant norms will shift as expressed in TV but because they want to make money. So it's like, it's a social progressive thing, but it's completely driven by the fact that they're all out to make money, which I thought was really interesting because a lot of um, other authors, like we talked about Meehan before, who brought, originally brought up this idea about artistry versus industry, was like, no, you know, like, the per like Meehan's a communist, like, red-blooded kind of thing, and not, I mean, that's just her political view. And so in her article, she talks a lot about how, like, this balance is sort of like against social progress and like capitalism is trying to reassert the dominant norms all the time and while it's television could be trying to challenge it since they're always trying to make money they're just gonna go with what works and so these ideas playing off each other I think it's really interesting it's like the whole the whole course yeah. really goes back to cultural forum does the fact that these ideas are brought up does that actually help social change like Newcomb and Hirsch say, like, does just having the conversation really mean anything, or do you have to have, like, progressive results? Does Lucy have to be able to finally go out and get her job for there to be social progress, 
or is simply bringing up the possibility that she could have a job mean that there's social progress, even though at the end of the episode, the status quo is, you know, it's back to what it was at the beginning. Well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to jump too far ahead because towards the end of the course, I want to, I want to get a better idea of what your conclusions were, but what, <clears throat> I mean, could you guys pick that apart for me? Like what kind what kind of conclusions did the class make as far as <clears throat> like, how did the two influence each other? Can you really get like, genuine ideas and change out of media that's that, that's kind of like coming out of a system like, like the United right. States has where it's driven by profit? Something that we um, studied, the second sort of section of the course um, where we studied African Americans in television, um, we read um, several chapters out of Herman Gray's book, um, Watching Race, I believe, and he... Um, gives a sort of context of the 1980s in particular when we see this sort of space opening up in television where um, there's going to be a prevalence of African-American television. And we're going to see African-American um, producers and actors becoming sort of the, their, the own, their own authors of what sort of media um, is going to be out there about blacks. Um, and that's a really, I think, a good example example of a time period where we see this sort of tension between artistry and industry. For example, we studied the, the Cosby show, um, which to many it seemed very, very progressive. We have Bill Cosby, who's the producer of the show, um, has like complete, pretty much complete control over what is being uh, discussed. Um, but at the same time, a lot of critics of the show argue that it um, sort of takes on a kind of a, I think the term is pluralist, separate but equal sort of mode of representation. It, they're living in this universe that's completely independent of their Caucasian counterpart. Um, so that's sort of an example of how we see um, maybe like the industry, the norm sort of like seeping in there. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Um, well, for the period. second section I wrote about In Living Color, so I didn't oh, study cool. the... Um, you want to talk a bit more about that? Uh, uh, yeah, so In Living Color was a variety show, as we mentioned earlier, with uh, by the Waynes Brothers as the producers and writers. And um, Gray, uh, whose book was most of what we read for the second chapter, sort of picks a fight almost with Newcomb and Hirsch about their cultural forum saying that, okay, all of these norms are challenged, but the fact that they go back to the status quo reinforces the status quo instead of allows for progression. And he argues that you can see this really well in In Living Color because they do, they did really racy skits, basically, for the time period. Mm -hmm. Like, they had Boy. what they called the Homeboy Shopping right. Network, which was, like, <laughs> two punk black gangsters, I mean, like, if you go back and watch the show, it's really hilarious because it's like early '90s, and so they've got like really, really colorful, outfits. you know, outfits, mm -hmm. and it's like the stereotypical gangster. And they're like, it, there was one they were like in a used car lot, and it's the homeboy shopping network for cars, and they're gonna just like they just like start stealing cars. And so this goes back to the idea of ambivalence as well. Is it's like, okay, does this mean like is this a criticism of that, or is this a we're black, this is how we are, and we're proud of that. Yeah, it's enforcing it. Right, so is, it can be read either way, depending on, like, your personal viewpoint. And so Gray argues the fact that it could be read either way means that actually the cultural forum can lead to, like, a regression, like, back to more racism because they see, oh, well, all black people just steal cars. And it's like, is that really what the producers meant? Probably not. But because, because it can be read either way, do you get progress or do you get like regression? That's the that's a limit of comedy that I sort of saw coming out through the whole course because we focused on comedy as I said earlier, is that like you can only do so much because you're hiding behind or sometimes you can only do so much because you're hiding behind the like oh I'm just a show so like if people start getting all upset they're like oh it's just a television show it's just for laughs it's just comedy which means that they can break a lot more rules than say something that's supposed to be like a serious piece of art or something like that but at the same time people can write it off a little bit more easily saying oh it's just comedy all right you guys we have to take a quick break we have a public service announcement and then we've got some john lennon coming at you here on kups 90.1 fm's coma the sound we'll be right back Read your child a bedtime story. Awesome. <laughs> cool. 
I remember the spotlight, so it's more like spotlight. Mm -hmm. Alright, I'm gonna bring it back on. Ooh, texture. All right, everybody, welcome back. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. My name is Casey Krolchek, and I'm the host of the show across campus. And today we're talking about a comm course called Television Culture, and we have Kira and Jenny here in the studio to talk with us about it. So in this third, in this third segment, uh, we, we've already gone through some, some like the basic structure of the course. We went through some vocab that was necessary to go through a conversation. And we briefly touched on shows like I Love Lucy and then represent, representations of black Americans in the 80s. How did you guys use these course concepts to look at media examples uh, from the current day and what's happening right now? Um, we, uh, for our more modern section of the class, the last section, we looked at um, broadcast journalism and sort of how it's changed from the early era when it was Walter Cronkite in the 50s, 60s, and I think some of the 70s, mm -hmm. and sort of compared that to the current day where there's a million media outlets and the internet is a huge source of media, and how the comedians, Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert, have all of a sudden become like a huge source of real news for people, and sort of like how they interact with the rest of news media. Um, yeah, and sort of in this section we study the balance between... Um, you know, news media offering um, reputable, like, information, but sort of what is taken away as news media in general becomes, turns more, much more into infotainment, which is a term to describe um, a lot of the news that we see today. You have, like, cable news, which is, like, 24-hour news. You don't have the dominant, like, the big three networks that are the only sources of news anymore, mm -hmm. such as... Um, Fox and CBS and NBC. Um, so because the market has been expanded and because of the nature of the industry, you see, again, um, like more and more competition the, for advertisers for these news programs. So what we see is news programs are starting to become much more sensational. Um, they are turning into entertainment. There's like a, you can't, you can't really tell the difference between sometimes between the Colbert Report and cable news, it's it's pretty remarkable. Well, and can you can you guys pick up like the, the sides in that? Like you, you brought up Stephen Colbert and you brought up John Stewart as guys who kind of do like what some would call pretend news. I don't know. I watch those shows and it's like no, they're actually talking about real news. Like that's that is stuff that's like going on, and they're looking at it from this different perspective. And but then you also have like these like. The, the more traditional media outlets like like NBC, ABC, CBS, um, like, what's the nature of that conflict there? Like, who who's taking what side and what 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 are their arguments? Well, for this section of the class, we read um, a book by Jeffrey Bain called the From Con Cronkite to, to Colbert, the evolution, the evolution of Broadcast Journalism. Yeah. thank you, Jenny. Um, no and he says that um, back in the day when. It was Walter Cronkite and uh, just the major networks doing the news. There was sort of a an unwritten code of journalism that you know you it was to increase democratic accountability and make sure the citizens were informed and like there should be no entertainment involved at all and it's all just facts, facts, facts. Um, what they like and they really wanted to be like objective, although they didn't realize this is only the white male point of view. But they were like, no, we're objective. And then um, Bame, the author, talks about how that sort of shifted with, uh, as Jenny was saying, the change in technology, meaning there's a lot more competition for viewers, and so it turned into sort of infotainment in the 80s and 90s and now. And um, Bame argues that Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert come in and sort of take infotainment to a whole new level so that it's actual real news by... They, they sort of take a different perspective. The, like... People on, say, CNN or Fox or any of the cable news shows tend to look at the the same, they all take the same perspective, is what Bame argues, on any piece of big news. And that Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert come in with just an alternate perspective. And yeah, they're doing it under the guise of comedy so that they can say, like, so they can do whatever they want, so they can get laughs and 
they don't feel like they have to be like respectable journalists or hold themselves right. to that really high standard. But by bringing in an alternate perspective, they're helping citizens be more informed. They show the other side of the picture that might not be shown. Additionally, um, something that we discussed was there's a shift, and Kira Kira mentioned this when she said the the high modern journalism, which is from the 50s through the 70s, where you have this sort of top down. Um, viewers are just sort of consuming what is being said to them from, you know, a few sources. You have sort of this spreading out of who who can sort of contribute to to journalism, and you have more of a um, what's the term? I don't know. It's more horizontal. It's less like top down vertical. Mm -hmm. um, less hierarchical and, in, na in nature. Yeah, but you have you have not only do you have like cable news. But you have now, with the advent of inter the internet and YouTube, pe just average viewers can contribute their own commentary. And oftentimes, we see Colbert and Stewart like turning to those sources. And what Bame argues is that in this new phase of journalism, which he terms neo-modern uh, journalism, because he argues that s that Colbert and and Stewart are sort of advocating similar ideals as high modern, with sort of keeping keeping um, the White House accountable and keeping other media uh, people accountable. Um, with that sort of integration of, of viewer interaction, you have a much more like democratized sort of journalistic experience. But then you sort of have to wonder what's being lost um, when you have lots and lots of people contributing at once. It's not just sort of one kind of source. Well, what one one question that I, that I have, like you, you said that. Like with with YouTube and all the and like all the access to blogging that we have on the on the internet now, like is is John are John Stewart and Stephen Colbert really surfing around on YouTube to find like that? Yes, they are. <laughs> okay, they, they are okay. actually doing that. Um, I think uh, Professor Owen was said that they have mastered the TiVo. They, it seems like they spend their entire day. I mean, I have no idea they, they, how they spend well, their day. Well, I'm sure they have they, staff teams that'll do right. this for them. But they like, go when we talk and about look for every single clip of any politician or someone in the public sphere saying, like, saying something and then changing their mind like two weeks later, and they'll show that on their TV. Like, that's what they do. I remember um, we started talking about this part of the class, uh, or this last section in, uh, I think it was like late October, early November, when the Herman Cain, like, sex scandal thing was just starting mm -hmm. to happen and so we were watching a lot of Daily Show in class and Stewart would just like play this clip of you know what happened the day before Herman Cain saying like I have no idea what you're talking about what settlement and then show a clip from like five years earlier when the settlement thing was going on and he's like oh yeah we had a settlement and so basically just show that like okay this guy is lying his face off and it's on TV and so he goes back he finds it like, if someone has said something different than what they're saying right now, he'll show it on TV and then make fun of it and just, like, laugh. And at this, so it's, like, combining comedy with you screwed up and we're holding you accountable as the public so that people are informed and they know what's going on. On a side note, this sounds like a class that I would enjoy taking <laughs> because normally I have to set aside time to go to class and then I have to set aside the 20 minutes to watch the, the Jon Stewart show or Stephen Colbert. It sounds like I could actually like, save myself a lot of time by just like combining the two, like make the the TV show to class. But yeah, but that was just was fun. I thought that popped the thought that popped into my head made made, made me laugh to myself. It was <laughs> yeah. Anyways, sorry. it was definitely fun to be able to be like, oh yes, I have to stay up and watch this. It's for class. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um. Well, I guess we we only have a couple minutes left in this segment. Was, were there any other topics that you wanted to bring up as far as? Uh, I guess like conflict co conflicts that you conflicts that you saw, or just like those modern day examples. Like anything else that popped out to you guys that you wanted to bring up? Um, let's see. Well, I, it was really interesting seeing how uh, comedy kind of relates to news news media news the news medium. Um, and when I heard that we were going to be studying journalism, I like couldn't understand at first like how comedy had anything to do with like that sort of aspect of television and it was cool seeing how these terms that we had studied such as cultural forum, liminal space really do apply to um, like the Colbert Report and 
the the Daily Show. Um, the you know their use of comedy provides them with that liminal space to sort of um, they're kind of free to um, do very outrageous things and. Colbert, in particular, as well as Stewart, uses um, carnival as a as a a style, um, which is something like where you go totally over the top. Right. You use dirty jokes to make fun of anything that society holds higher, like an yeah. ideal. It's called like leveling. That. Like during the Herman Cain clips, he he sort of leveled him from his position of entrepreneur and politician to you know just being subjected to criticism like the average person would be. Um, so that was a that was a key kind of style that was kind of correlated to um, their two shows. And something that critic um, Lisa Coletta argued sort of took away from the critique that they were trying to offer is the fact that um, they're, they're being very, like, carnivalistic and very extreme and... Um, Again, you see this sort of tension between artistry and industry. These shows are their income, so they need to they need to like keep viewers watching. And Coletta argues that if their critique was to be truly effective, their shows would be telling the viewers to turn the television off and stop being passive consumers of television and actually go do something. So that was sort of a key issue that we kind of concluded with in that segment. All right, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma. The sound. We'll be right back. Sounds good, y'all. All right, welcome back, everybody. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. My name is Casey Krolchek. I'm the host of Across Campus, the show you're listening to. And today we are talking about television culture. It's a class that was offered last semester. I'm guessing it'll be there in the future, but we have Kira and Jenny here in the studio talking with us about it. And we, we've already gone through like the layout, the layout of the course. We talked about um, some key terms and some key vocab that you need to know in order to have a conversation within this class. And then we kind of applied, we applied some of those concepts to media that you see today. And moving into this final segment, uh, we're going to be talking about conclusions that we made. And so I guess the way that I wanted to pose it, like if you guys were to put together an ideal television media system, like in how we produce it and how we consume it, like what would that, what would that look like? So interesting because it's, it's, been really, it's been really fascinating to see the television of the television. The evolution of television. We've been talking a lot about television. That's okay. <laughs> over the over the past fifty years, and how consumers actually consume television. Like I rarely watch television off of, from a television. I watch it on my computer, and it's so fascinating to think about how that impacts just the way that we, you know, different audiences like receive these messages. And like I can watch television shows on my phone, like. And that's something that we sort of talked about in the last segment is this idea of convergence media, um, which I was trying to like kind of wrap my head around. Is this a good thing? Like, is is convergence media a good thing? Like, you know, this your you know each kind of media portal, like a smartphone or a computer or a television, even these days has multiple multiple functions. Like, you can access the internet through TV. You can access like television sh shows through your computer. Like, how is that affecting? Um, sort of like this market, and that's sort of like the market we have currently. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I don't know if it's a good thing or not. I can't, I can't come to any solid conclusions at this point. Well, I tended to be a little bit of an optimist with the <laughs> kind of conclusions. I, uh, despite like the last section of the class where we talked about how almost the like the falling apart of the news media, um, as Bain portrays it, with John Stewart and Stephen Colbert to come in and save us. Um, and maybe there could be some more positive changes in media and go from less sensationalizing to more investigative reporting. But overall, I think that television is a positive force. I know that sounds a little weird, but I mean, as a cultural forum, I think it really does give opportunities for conversations that can lead to progressive ideas. And that um, we really, because if you can't talk about something, you can't 
that no change can happen. Like, you have to be able to talk about it. Even if you have to say, like, it's just a comedy show, we don't really mean it. You're, you're putting the ideas into play in society, and people can have those conversations. And so it, it can act as a really positive force. I mean... Well, that, that being said, like, if you, when you look at shows like uh, John Stewart and Stephen Colbert's, uh, you know, you know you're, you're talking about how, like, media is really positive and that it gives us a place to talk about, like, di- different issues different to- and diff- different topics... But is it really, I mean, when, when you have to package up information and issues as comedy, like, are, are, you, are you really, I mean, I mean like, how do, you, how do you feel about that? Like, I think, I think it's good that guys like Stephen Colbert and John Stewart are bringing up issues that a lot of people, like, really aren't all that willing to delve into. But at the same time, like, do we really, are, are we really happy that we have to package up those messages as comedy? We sort of discussed that it's important to have a balance. Like, you can't expect to be the most informed citizen and only be watching the Daily Report or the Colbert, or the Daily Show and the Colbert Report. Like, you have to supplement your sort of news consumption with other, other sources so you have context for what these two comedians and fake newsmen are critiquing. Like, it's... It's, it's very, and that's just sort of in general, it's important to have a balance and to get the, the multiple perspective, um, multiple perspectives. Um, I don't know if you have anything to I say agree. About that. Um, you really need to just stay informed, I guess, <laughs> which is one of the things I definitely took away from the last section of the class was I really should watch more news or just, or not even watch more news yet. I mean, use my, I like the convergence culture. It makes things easier yeah. for me. Um, I can access a lot of different stuff on my computer, and it's like, maybe I should be doing that more. Um, Maybe I shouldn't have (laughs) Facebook be the way that I find out about important (laughs) political events. Well, did did you guys make any conclusions on, on, like, as as far as diversifying media sources? Because, like, in in the comic course that I took, like, one one of the major conclusions that the class made was that you should not be getting your news just from one source, because, I mean, any particular event can be viewed in Multiple. from so, from 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 many different perspectives and there 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 are really very few situations where you're just getting the facts like the facts are always I mean, e- even like those even the core information is kind of dependent on the situation that that you that you find yourself looking at it in and so did, did the class really, really address um, perspective and and just the, the number of sources that you're, oh, that you're yeah, looking at? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, the way that the course was set up, we, we studied it through the fam- framework of women in television. So we looked at how television addressed the growing feminist movement. Um, we looked at how television addressed the prevalence of black television. Um, and so, and then finally, we see in this last segment of, of studying the evolution of journalism, we see news media sort of like, who, what, what the outlets of news media sort of expanding. So you have this idea of a more democratized news system where anyone from the everyday citizen could have their own YouTube news, you know, commentary. <coughs> right, and so there's the diversifying of perspectives that are now able to go into news <coughs> and into media in general. And, I, th- I mean, I think that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Although there's still the the tension of like, well, somebody actually has to go out and get first-hand information, which is going to fall back a lot to the like professional news organization, but that people can take that then and build on that, adding their own perspectives, and we get a more broad and more democratic conversation, which is good because democracy sort of thrives on conversation and having multiple points of views. And so I think your original point was great, that yes, you need to diversify your news sources and your, maybe just your media sources in general, and uh, yay for computers and the internet for helping us do that. Why, and, like, while I, I, I really admire Kira for her positive <laughs> outlook, I'm quite quite more jaded than she is. Um, well, that's okay. But um, just from previous media courses I've taken. Dexter, but, uh, Gordon. Shout out, Dexter, Gordon. <laughs> um, I, like, it's great that like, news media has become more democratized in the sense that more people can put out news, but you have to look at the political economy and the fact that, like, all these media outlets are controlled by a handful of, like, ultra-wealthy white male 
like media moguls. Like it's there. It's incredible well, we, we how seen, connected we, all all media is, and it's it really is kind of coming from a single source still. But you have these scholars, some scholars like such as Bame, saying it, it has become more democratized. Um, but I don't know. I'm not really ready to accept that. Right, but they still want to make money, and so they're gonna go where people want them to go, because there's so many different sources available now that if your one news source like isn't looking at the issues that matter to you, you'll just go find it somewhere else. You'll go find it on YouTube. You'll go find it on randomblog.com. Like, I don't know. I think that it, the tension that we talked about earlier between artistry and industry, like, really actually helps because they want to make money and so they're going to give people what they want. Even if it's only a few guys controlling the traditional media outlets now, there's such a low barrier to entry to the internet. You just need an internet connection and the computer, which can be a substantial barrier but not compared to what it was in the 60s where you needed a news station and, like, anchors and reporters and researchers and all this stuff. All right, you guys, we're at the end of our hour, so I have to, I, I have to wrap it up. Kira, Jenny, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. This has been a lot of fun. All right, you're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. My name is Casey Krolchek, and I'm the host of Across Campus. We'll see you back here on Monday morning at 8 a.m.